You know, if God has a particular plan for our life, now think about this, and we remain in his will, I believe there's a strong chance now that we would be virtually indestructible until that plan for his life is fulfilled. Which only makes sense. I mean, what could possibly prevent God's plan? What could do that? Now, very few in the Bible illustrated that better than David did. And few things in his life did that better than his great battle with Goliath. Goliath. So what I'd like to do this morning is begin a two-part series on that battle. This week we'll review the Bible's account of the battle here in 1 Samuel 17 and next week I want us to draw a number of applications from it. Let's begin by looking at verse number one. We're in 1 Samuel 17th chapter. Look at verse number one. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shaco, which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Shaco and Azekah in Evesdemim. Now the Philistines had been recently defeated by the Jews in a great war. But here they were back for another try at it. And the fact that they noticed had gathered together at Shaco, which belongeth to Judah proves they had invaded Israel. And we're confident that this time they could win. They could win. You know, we through the power of Jesus can defeat Satan too. But that doesn't mean he's not going to come back for another try at it. And that this time he won't make deeper inroads into our life than he ever did before. And Saul verse 2 tells us, And the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, about six miles west of Jerusalem and set the battle in array or in formation to clash notice against the Philistines. Surely supposing that as they had soundly defeated them before they would soundly defeat them again. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs that went from his knees to his ankles and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So here we see what gave the Philistines the confidence they could win. And believe me, just to behold Goliath was to see quite a sight. Let me put him into perspective here. On the last checking, the tallest man alive today is a little under, eight and a half feet tall. Now, the tallest man in medical history was 8 feet 11 inches tall. And verse 4 tells us that Goliath's height was 6 cubits and a span. Now, how do we translate that? A cubit was 18 inches long, and a great cubit was 21 inches long. A span was half a cubit or 9 inches. So, depending on the cubit used here, he stood either 9 feet 9 inches tall or 11 feet three inches tall, which from the floor was well above the ceiling, well above the ceiling. Also, depending on his frame, he might have weighed somewhere between 600 and 1,000 pounds. I want to give you a very practical illustration of how big this man was. Our head in length, our head in length, is approximately one-sixth of our total height. Which means if Goliath stood even 11 feet tall, the length of his head would he be about 2 feet. So he looked something like this. <laughs> That's how big his head might have been, according to these measurements. In other words, if he walked in here and sat down beside you, <laughs> you'd definitely feel his presence. You'd definitely feel his presence. That's how big his head might have been. Now as for his armor, verse number 5 states that he was armed with a coat of mail, which were actually overlapping plates, brass plates that covered his back and his front. 
And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, which means it was 157 to 200 pounds, depending on the shekel that was used here. Now, if this man was as ferocious as he was huge and powerful, then he was a formidable enemy in anybody's book. Look at verse number 7. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead alone weighed 600 shekels of iron, or from 17 to 24 pounds, the spearhead alone. Now the Olympic racket for throwing a 16-pound shot put is about 67 feet, and yet Goliath hurled a spear that weighed more than that a greater distance, routinely in combat. So by any standard of comparison, this man was a killing machine. And notice so he could have both arms free to fight with. Verse 7 concludes by saying that one bearing a shield went before him to protect him from arrows, spears, and any blows from his enemy. All right. So who does a man this huge pick his fights with? Anybody he wants to. Anybody he wants to. As we see in verse number 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Perhaps down into the valley. If you be able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. So obviously his pride was as big as he was. But don't go thinking he was stupid because he wasn't. What he had come to do, he accomplished to the letter. We see it in verse number 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. All right, it was evident right from the start. This could not be a contest of might versus might, because Goliath could not be matched. It would have to be a contest between brawn and the flesh, of which Goliath had plenty, and faith in God, of which evidently Saul and his armies had little. I mean, look at them here. After one look at Goliath and hearing his challenge, they all became faithless, trembling cowards. Again, verse 11 tells us that when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, maybe there was a reason for their fear and why God gave them no courage. Because the good fortunes of killing this giant and removing the reproach he brought to God's people was going to fall to another. We read about him in verse number 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest. And the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine Goliath drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. To do what? To repeat the same challenge he had made before. Now, the fact, notice, that he drew near may suggest that he was coming closer every day. He descended the mountain where the Philistines were, passed through the valley, and then began to ascend the mountain where the Jews were encamped. So his confidence was building, as well as his defiance of Israel. Verse 17, And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, which was about three-fifths of a bushel, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy brethren, which was a distance of about twelve miles, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge, which may mean some assurance that they were all right. Now Saul and they, David's brothers, and all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines, maybe in skirmishes that broke out along their ranks. 
And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him and came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. Now, as I said before, the Philistines were confident that this time they could win. Because as Matthew Henry said, they were as proud of Goliath as he was of himself. All right, so David has arrived at the trench or the fortified encampment. Now, from here, he could smell the smoke of the campfires and the raw steel and sweat as both armies braced for the battle. And David, verse 22, tells us, left his carriage or his baggage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, his brothers, behold, they came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words, or according to the same challenge he made earlier. But as we all know, brethren, a bully can only go so far. Sooner or later, they cross paths with that one person who's not going to break down or back down. And Goliath is about to meet such a person. Now, after he repeated his challenges, the end of verse 23 tells us that this time, notice, David heard them. And as of the moment he did, Goliath's <laughs> no longer threatening destruction, but courting his own. The hunter is about to become the hunted. And all the men of Israel, verse 24 tells us, when they saw the man, who perhaps by now had come right up to their face, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give, him, give his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel, or free from taxes and service to the state. All right, while well, Goliath's defiance was increasing and everyone was fleeing from him, the shepherd boy wasn't going anywhere. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine or this raw heathen pagan that he should defy the armies of the living God? Hmm. You see, the way David figured it was this. If they were God's armies, then God stood with them. Therefore, to defy them was to defy him. Also, if the armies of God cower, it appears that God cowers too. And that was more than David could manage. So having the faith that made him fearless, he knew that God would give strength to anybody who believed this giant could be taken. Verse 27, And the people answered him, after this man is saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Or is there no purpose for me being here? With that gentle answer, he silenced his brother. And he turned from him, not in disrespect, but so as not to distract himself from his purpose toward another. And spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul the king. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Ooh. But what an example we have here of how unlimited God is. Look at this. He sends a simple shepherd to calm the hearts of an entire army. How? By offering to go in their place and fight the enemy they all feared. Brethren, listen. I don't care how little you are in God's family. When he calls you to do something, Never, ever underestimate your potentials in him. When he calls you to do something, he equips you for it. Verse 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David, who was about 20 years old at the time, said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. 
All right, before we continue, I want to pause to kind of size up these two animals. I was in the zoo one time in a lion in a cage behind me. Let out this loud, fierce, guttural roar that literally almost froze me to the ground. I mean, you could feel the vibrations in the air. And at that moment, all I could think of was this. If I was in the jungle and I heard a lion roar like that, I'd be dead already. Just hearing him, I'd be dead. <laughs> Another occasion, I was in a campground in Canada and I encountered a bear. The only thing between us was this steel trash barrel. All of a sudden, he got angry and he hit this thing with his paw and sent it flying through the air as easy as I could tip over that cup. Now there's nothing between us but air. And then all of a sudden, he just flew off into the woods. Now, on both those occasions, and I remember it keenly, I not only felt the power of those animals, but also the tremendous fear, the fear they can instill in you. Well, David had his encounter with both of those animals. He tells us about it here. That as he tended his father's sheep, there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. Verse 35. And I went out after him, and smote him, or struck him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, with his bare hands, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, or I killed them both. And having done that to them, I have no doubt that this uncircumcised Philistine, he said, shall be as one of them, meaning dead, after I've dealt with them. Seeing so you have to fight the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the poor of the lion and out of the poor of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. <laughs> now, a Goliath's size and strength caused the whole Jewish army to shudder. Obviously, David looked past all of that. He saw Goliath as a mere man who stood in his own strength. So to David, he was merely an uncircumcised Philistine. That's it, period. But on the other hand, David knew in whose strength he stood. And since God had empowered him, he also knew he was invincible. He convinced Saul. The last part of verse 37 says, And Saul said unto David, Realizing he has the strength for war and the heart for war, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So David no longer has to beg to fight. He's now under orders to fight. Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, supposing to give him the best his nation could provide. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it or tested it through use. And David said unto Saul, uncomfortable in this attire now. I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, since rough stones might fly from his sling inaccurately. And put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now, it's at points like this in the story that many draw the wrong conclusion. For example, David's sling here was not a toy. The ancient Hebrews could hurl a stone from a sling with such force, it could actually penetrate armor. And according to Judges 20:16, with such accuracy, they could hit a single strand of hair from a distance. Also remember, according to Psalm 18, David could break a bow of steel with his arms. So a sling in his hand was pretty lethal. All right, let's look at the scene again. Observe while the Jews were retreating. David wasn't merely standing his ground. He was advancing toward Goliath. The end of verse 40 tells us that David drew near to the Philistine. And verse 41 tells us, And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. So obviously, David and his enemy have met. And when the Philistine looked about for an armed warrior to fight with and saw David, he disdained him. For he had no respect for him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. Now obviously, let's face it, nobody could have possibly impressed David, uh, Goliath. I don't care how fierce he was or how well armed he was. So to see a fierce-skinned young shepherd standing there with a staff in his hand was an affront to his pride. Not only was he not challenged by him, he was insulted by David. In fact, Goliath is beginning to think that the Jews have sent David to mock him. Woo. Verse 43. 
And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? Referring to his staff that shepherds did use incidentally to control dogs with. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So not only was he embarrassed by David, he was enraged by David. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. So notice Goliath never even contemplated defeat. Never even saw the possibility. Now undoubtedly by those threats, he expects David to beg for mercy. And with that, he could recover his pride. But hardly <laughs> did he expect what followed. David has some threats of his own. Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And brethren, that is how David always stood. Even when he became Israel's greatest soldier, he declared, The Lord is my strength and my shield. Therefore he could say with all confidence in verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For which reason I need neither, nor am I intimidated by either. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Ooh. So far from begging for mercy, David was anxious for this fight to begin. Blind with rage, Goliath charges against him. Verse 48 tells us, And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran, but notice, not for the hills or back home, but toward the army to meet the Philistine. Mm -hmm. Now it's possible to gain the advantage on the field that Goliath first used his spear. Perhaps he reared it back and with all of his strength hurled it at David. David sidestepped it and kept advancing. Verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone, loaded his sling, swung it around his head, and the Bible says he slang it with all of his might and skill. The shield bearer couldn't block it, nor could Goliath escape. But hence the verse tells us, It smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. And that quickly, it was over. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him, perhaps plunging it deep into his heart and cut off his head therewith. So not only did he defeat him with a sling, he killed him with his own weapon. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, stunned by what had just taken place, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines. Do thou come to the valley, <coughs> into the gates of Ekron? And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of his host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. All right, admittedly, this was no sermon. Actually, it was just a look at one of the classic battles in history. But was it just that, simply a classic battle? Or, brethren, do we find in this conflict between David and his gigantic opponent some marvelous types of our struggles today with Satan and with evil? Now, I personally saw some wonderful lessons in this chapter for Christians today. Applications that we can use to be victorious just like David was. Now, next week, what I want to do is I want to share some of the applications I saw 
beautiful applications in this chapter that I saw of how we too are to fight our warfare in this world today against spiritual wickedness. And you know what I want you to do? Uh, I really need you to do this, please. Would you study this chapter again? Look at it carefully and see what applications you see in it. And when we gather here next week, let's kind of share them together. Let's have a good, rich time in God's Word next week. I'm going to be sharing a message of the applications I've seen, but I want to hear what you see.